the March meet, the March meeting of the advisory council. So you know when you get to the end of the year and you say where did the year go? Well, here we are watching it go. We're like you know about a third of the way through. So so I'm happy happy here. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to Stella uh, to um, get started. Thanks, Len. Um, and hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, welcome to the March 8th meeting of the Regional Transportation Advisory Council. I'm just going to go through our housekeeping items here, and then we can get started. So uh, you are invited to participate in our transportation planning process, regardless of your race, uh, color, uh, national origin, including limited English proficiency, religion, creed, gender, ancestry, ethnicity, disability, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, veteran status or background. You can read the full notice of your rights and protections at www.austinmpo.org slash mpo underscore non underscore d-i-s-c-r-i-m-i-n-a-t-i-o-n. This meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant with the exceptions to the following standards, web content accessibility guidelines, 2.1 level AA standards, and revised section 508 standards. If you require any additional accommodations in order to participate fully in this meeting, please contact me, Stella Jordan, uh, at sjordan at ctps.org or at 857-702-3675. You will have joined the meeting with muted microphones. Um, please remain muted unless you're actively speaking. At this point, if you have not done so already, please rename yourself to include your first name, last name, and affiliation. Um, you may mute and unmute yourselves during the discussion. To participate in this discussion, please select the raised hand function. You can find this by either clicking on the participants button at the bottom of the screen, and a window will pop up with a raised hand button at the bottom, or you can find this in the reactions button in the toolbar in the chair will call on you. And if you're joining us by phone today, you can use star nine to raise your hand. Again, if you have any technical difficulties, questions, Please don't hesitate to contact me during the meeting. You can contact me via the chat box in Zoom at sjordan at ctps.org or at 857-702-3675. And I will hand it back to Len for introductions. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. And, and we have a pretty um, big crowd here uh, today. So we're going to... Um, skip the like going around and doing introductions but if you want to drop something um in the chat about yourself we we ought to appreciate um seeing it but you don't have to you know so uh with that i'm going to now go to um shrika murthy um to tell us about the, um the big bang the universe you know the upwp studies you know quite the universe it is this time thanks Shrika. Thank you, Lynn, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me at your meeting today to discuss the federal fiscal year 2024 raw universe of proposed studies. Um, next slide, please, Stella. Uh, so this year, we received about 80 studies in total through our outreach efforts, with the majority of studies included in the universe coming from our public survey. Posted on the calendar today uh, for today's meeting is the PDF version of the Royal Universe of Proposed Studies. Um, and I invite you to have that pulled up uh, during our discussion um, because it is a 35 page PDF. Um, I won't be able to scroll through it as fast as possible uh, to keep up with discussion, but I will have it shared on my screen as well, if possible, Stella. Um, each study idea uh, that we received was categorized under one of six categories. Those are active transportation, land use, multimodal mobility, resiliency, technical support or other, and transit equity. Each entry also notes how that proposal was received and from whom, uh, when possible. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so staff discussions have begun um, on the universe. We held uh, a meeting with program managers and group managers last week, uh, and we spoke with the managers and directors group this week um, to start going through the list and to start thinking about what our internal priorities are and how uh, some of these studies might align. Um, looking a little bit ahead, uh, our tech is our first external presentation on the universe. Um, we are presenting to the UPWP committee on March 16th. Um, and the following meetings will be to develop a final universe of proposed studies. This is what you might find in Appendix uh, C of the UPWP itself. And it is from this list that the committee chooses which studies to ultimately fund. Uh, towards the end of April and the beginning of May, uh, the committee will decide on a final list of studies to fund as part of the discrete studies program. Um, and at the same time, as we are working on this program, uh, we are developing out the rest of the document um, that includes conversations on budgets, program descriptions, and uh, all of the other fun things that go into the PWP. Uh, so my main ask to this group is for members to discuss these studies and debate their merits. Um, and to develop a list of RTAC recommended studies. Uh, so in the years past, we've used a staff recommended list and a committee ranked list to aid in making these final decisions about which studies to fund. Uh, from this year, I'd like to ask RTAC to develop a formal list as well to aid in making those final decisions. Um, by asking for a final list, I would also like to formalize a method for RTAC to provide uh, your input on studies in a way that is accountable and straightforward. So year after year, we can go back and look at which studies our TAC did recommend, um, which studies did end up being funded. And that way we also have a much clearer sense of our tax priorities going into development each year. Um, next slide, please tell I think, if there is one. Um, so with that, I will ask the chair to hold a discussion on these studies, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Trilika. You know, so so um, as Trilika um, stated, we want to kind of keep it high level. You know, mostly in types of studies. You know, uh, uh, I know it's going to be challenging to do that. You know, so so I mean, if you you know start talking about a specific study, he not going to shut down the conversation, but not going to um, extend on it either. You know, so so um, so. And as she said, we will create our own list. And um, I remember your timeline. I mean, um, from some other something else I read, but I don't recall it here. Um, when when do you plan to create um, the your list? Um, that you'll present to the UPWP committee, Jalika? So if I'm not mistaken, the staff recommended list, um, we start working on that the end of March and beginning of April. Um, and I also send out a survey to the committee to rank their study ideas yeah. um, around the same time. So I'm asking RTAC for their recommended list uh, by the end of the April 12th meeting. Oh, so you know, our April 12th meeting. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, maybe I guess you did say that earlier. Okay, fine. So that gives us a, a whole meeting. So, so yeah. So then we have time to to work on this you know, and and maybe develop a, a method you know, of helping us to um, finalize our our, our list. I, mean, I don't. I mean, maybe towards the end of this meeting, we can discuss whether or not we want to have uh, another meeting. You know, in between this one um, of a subset I mean, of of um, the advisory council and. Uh, I mean, if it's less than a forum, we don't need it to be a formal meeting. If there's going to be more than a forum, then it will be need to be a formal meeting. So, so anyways, so let me just um open up to folks, and I'll say one other thing. I mean, we are the first ones seeing this, but it's not so much that that's a policy shift. I mean, uh, it's more of a calendar um event. I mean, uh, because I mean, uh, our meeting just happens to come before the first um UPWT committee meeting. You know, uh, unlike with public uh, participation in uh, where the advisory council really should be uh, the first one to see that. I mean, that's not the case with the UPWP. So I just want to make it clear that you know, we are getting the first, but 
um, is this um, is a circumstantial thing. But nonetheless, I'm thrilled that we are seeing it first. So with that, um, I turn to John McQueen. Yeah, uh, do you see the uh, next screening, I guess, uh, going through these three C's committee? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, I mean Andy's, if, Andy's three C committee. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm glad, mm -hmm. glad, glad he's still the chair of that. That's good. You know, uh, I mean, not necessarily, I mean, uh, uh, but if people think that we do need, I mean, uh, more time to uh, discuss this, I mean, I mean, I mean, those meetings are usually I mean, 90 minutes or so. I mean, I'd be fine uh, with with organizing that or, or get, uh, yeah, I'd be fine to have, help have that happen. And uh, so so I guess maybe we'll see how far we get in this conversation. Andy? <laughs> yeah, one question that I had is like, in terms of our own kind of list of discrete studies, uh, I was just thinking, in terms of how we want to move forward as the RTAC kind of get us to an outcome where we do have that list. There's a couple of ways that I thought we could go about it and wanted to get a sense from everybody what seemed to make sense. So there's clearly kind of categorizations of the different types of kind of project ideas. There's like transit projects, there's, you know, resilience projects, there's certain ones. You know, one way to go about it could be just kind of having a ranking within those categories, or there could be a global ranking in terms of we feel that, um, you know, it is possible to rank them and kind of set them off from each other and go, you know, one to 20, whatever, how many ever study ideas there are, or maybe top five or top 10, however, but, you know, those are the ones that us as a, a group feel like are the most important. And I wanted to get a sense from people if they've had the chance to, I know I had a chance to just skim, you know, I don't really have a strong feeling one way or another, but what would be more valuable as input is kind of what, you know, question comes to mind looking at this list. So maybe this is a little bit to the group, but also a little bit to Sri Lanka too. You know, what would be better for you to hear as input from us? Because I'm, I'm sure you all are thinking about how this may fit in with your own process too. Yeah, I don't necessarily have an opinion either way on which, um, which methodology for choosing a list works. Um, if, whichever i guess is chosen it would be great to know how um, that list reflects your priorities as a group so whether that is choosing a few topics of the six that uh, you care most about and those have studies you care more about then that's one way or um or just you know whatever works um i'm not really very picky so so um so i'll ask it unless we need to see the screen like if someone ask you to pull up and share it you um know, in the pdf you know we can drop this for now while we're having a conversation um so okay great thanks uh so franny but still raise your hands electronically so i can see the order um yeah. franny um i i have been totally um overwhelmed and i have not gone through these so one thing that would be helpful i don't I mean i, I didn't I have to look at, again at the it's, agenda how much time we have with with sri Lanka. Oh, well, we have about 45 minutes, you know, um, so. because it, I would find it useful. First of all, I'm very relieved that we have another meeting that where we can summarize our our responses. You know, we could collect information and I like your idea of maybe setting a time um, that whoever wanted to could come and meet. But I like that we can firm up our recommendations at the April meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but I. And, and especially we could there's probably time to publish opinions about us to the agenda so that it's in the open meeting law requirements such that we can read those before the next meeting and come to that meeting knowing what other people's opinions are if we don't meet but anyway i sure. i would love to have the sort of elevator speech about these i don't know if anybody else would benefit from that um to have the, um Sirlika read our the, read the, through the list and say, okay, so in this area, we have a study on this and we have another study on this, which is sort of similar to this one, and blah, blah, but just sort of like a, about half a sentence about each one, sort of yes. giving us the whole big picture. I don't love the idea, um, sorry, with all respect to Andy, of, of voting, and um, I know you weren't sure of this idea anyway, of saying um, my top within this category, my top within this category, because I think that's an artificial way. There might be 
two really outstanding study ideas in one category or something like that. But that's the only reason I wouldn't want to do that. Well, but I don't know how other people feel about hearing um, a little bit of yeah. a general well, summary of them. Well, I mean, I'm going to step in because there are 80 of them. I mean, I, I appreciate that that you were um, not available able to, to read them before the meeting, uh, but uh, but that, that's just going to take too much time. I mean, okay, uh, so, I, so 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 if not, the discussion, excuse me, if discussion right. I mean ends, I mean, and we it seems like there's dead air um in the time that we have and there's and then striker can go through them we will but but, um, but we're not going to do that right now okay so so I, I it doesn't have to be study by study but if there's a general picture like this year we um had a lot of study ideas that related to blah 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 or just the general feel from someone who's been studying them and present and looking at them so carefully i would just love to hear some kind of um summary impression of the whole universe um well, there are the six yeah. categories so like when you can run through that uh yeah, that's what i mean yeah. yeah i can just run through the categories really yeah, quickly yeah, sure. um i'm just going to ask that folks have it pulled up on their own screens yeah. uh, for the sake of conversation um let's see so we have eight studies in active transportation um Again, a good majority of them submitted through the public survey. Um, there weren't really too many unifying themes. We did see a couple studies uh, across categories that discussed um, walking and biking connections to uh, existing MBTA stations um, in different forms. We have one very interesting study um, submitted by a group at MIT regarding a travel diary uh, study that would be um, looking at survey participants' uh, travel patterns in the Boston area um, using a methodology that MIT grad students have developed. Um, let's see. So that is active transportation. Moving on to land use, we've got three, four, five studies in land use. Uh, one of which, one of which, submitted uh, by the Livable Streets Alliance that we worked with them uh, to develop this proposal. That's their study is on integrating greenways, transit, and housing development. A really interesting. Um, sort of big picture look at three of those issues. They also submitted a study on leveraging lab development, um, looking at traffic patterns, uh, possibilities for mode shift um, and development relating to uh, lab development in the Boston area, similar to an existing study that's happening uh, titled the Lab and Municipal Parking Study, was funded in last year's UPWP and uh, has been proposed for funding this year as well. Um, there are, there is a study on um, ways for the NPO to su uh, support transit-oriented development. Um, and let's see, and an additional study submitted by an MIT group um, looking to incentivize a TOD um, through, uh, let me see, through, I suppose, um, What's the word? Through expediting the entitlement process. Uh, this is again someone's thesis and they're looking to uh, expand the scope of their study. Uh, moving on to roadway and multimodal mobility. Of course, we have the lab and municipal parking uh, study phase two. Um, we have a couple of studies submitted by staff relating to parking management systems on MBTA lots, um, a contraflow study. Um, and a study on variable speed limits on freeways, uh, some work that has been done, I think, elsewhere in the country, but maybe this is the first time it's being brought to the Boston region. Um, we have a very interesting study on uh, managed retreat, a pretty controversial subject, um, and something that the MPO has not really discussed before, so uh, it is somewhat timely as well. Um, uh, another roadway pricing study, um, I believe it's building upon this year's uh, roadway pricing study, um, and it's seen somewhat as a part two. Uh, this one would be focused more on engagement. 
Um, let's see. Uh, we do have a study uh, discussing measuring compliance with existing safety laws. Um, so that kind of rounds out our multimodal mobility section. Uh, in transit, we have a study that garnered a lot of discussion, a lot of positive opinions among staff on effective ways to reduce school-related vehicle trips. Um, outside of the suburbs, uh, Boston region schools tend to be very car focused. There isn't necessarily a public school bus system. Um, and members of staff that our parents have very personal experience with you know, being stuck in traffic for long uh, wait times. Um, and there's questions of safety as well as con congestion um, for this specific area. So this one's uh, garnered a lot of discussion. Um, there is a study uh, reviewing and analyzing the Community Connections Shuttle Program. Um, there is also a study submitted by our very own Logan Casey, who is here today, uh, car sharing uh, overview and opportunities in the Boston region. Um, and if you don't mind, Logan, if there are questions, I'm gonna defer them straight to you. Uh, you're probably the best person to speak on this. Um, let's jump down. Uh, Sandy uh, Johnston, our favorite, submitted a few uh, studies uh, from the MBTA. Um, a guidebook to accessible road design, station access prioritization and guidance, um, demographic change and transit propensity in Eastern Massachusetts. Um, jumping down a little bit further, we have um, a pretty interesting study submitted by Susan Barrett uh, relating to um, mapping out the transportation network and if essentially developing a full transit plan for the Boston region, um, integrating MBTA and RTA services. Um, let's see. A few studies on maintenance challenges uh, relating to um, potential environmental, uh, environmental disasters, uh, changing climate, um, let's see. All right, so that kind of uh, rounds out the transit section. I will note a fair number of studies relating to regional transit authorities um, and work relating to them. Under resiliency, we have a study on modeling evacuation routes using the travel demand model. We have a study, uh, Strategies for Environmental Outreach and Engagement, and uh, that's our very own Stella Jordan study. Um, MPO Support for Transportation Network Electrification. This is a staff submitted study um, and comes out of a lot of conversations we've been having internally uh, relating to the Long Range Transportation Plans Needs Assessment. Um, and under Technical Support, we have a pretty interesting study titled Evaluating the Effectiveness of Public Engagement, um, looking at modeling uncertainty uh, using the travel demand model, of course, um, a study on MPO governance models, um, looking at what other model types there are, by uh, what model types are used by other MPOs, strengths and weaknesses, um, any best practices, Let's see. Um, and then jumping down to transit equity, uh, we have a very interesting study uh, titled The Plan Conveil to Pit Project Scoring, submitted by staff, uh, which would be using, um, using Conveil's uh, destination access analysis application um, to help the MPS select projects that would help it achieve uh, objectives in its access and connectivity goal areas. Um, a transportation climate and health equity study, um, identifying transit options that would match transportation underserved workers with transportation underserved employers. Um, a really interesting wide ranging study um, with a lot of potential impacts. So that was just a very quick run through of the universe. Again, we've got about like 76 projects here. Um, but hopefully that got some um, no, thoughts that's going. Good. Thank you. It's it's great to hear your little details you throw in. And um, th 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 to me, that's helpful. 
sort of. Well, <laughs> I guess that's quick compared to I, what's there. <laughs> but, I, hope it, uh, I hope it is um, yeah. helpful to other people and yeah, it sorry. wasn't just me. Who... Um, so John. Yeah, um, I think it would help also, uh, I guess, pragmatically for us before we even go start ranking or reviewing, um, just to uh, give us some background in terms of what the real budgets are in total and uh, for all the uh, UPWP uh, studies in total. And uh, because it's, it's not a, a very generous budget, if you will. And some of these studies uh, that are recommended really fall way outside, I think, in terms of realistic fundability, in terms of the scope that they really um, uh, encompass. A lot of them really also might be reassigned to uh, more specific entities, such as uh, BTD, um, uh, some of the uh, MBTA capital um, analyses and things like that operationally. Uh, and other agencies, uh, because they'd be able to fund the scope and they also maybe have more of a proprietary ongoing uh, study that they can either hitch it on to or, or whatever. But I think, I mean, a number of these, for instance, um, you know, some of these where it's, what's the ideal regional network, uh, which is a great, great topic for uh, the transportation, as well as what's the, di you know, the what are the dynamics of the demographic shifts <laughs> within Eastern Massachusetts and how do they affect uh, the transportation uh, system? I mean, those are, those are big studies. I mean, those uh, could be easily six figures by themselves. I mean, big six figures uh, or higher uh, because those are massive. Maybe they fall under the LRTP needs assessment areas. I mean, something that scope is just too big, I think, for UPWP, which really is, is helped by uh, some of the more discrete studies and, and research analyses and, and things like that. They fall way beyond that, and as well as perhaps some eye toward uh, what's the actionability is on some of these. Um, for instance, um, you know, if there's any onboard um, real-time speed compliance on the roadway, well, what are you gonna do? <laughs> what are you gonna do with that information? You're gonna pull somebody over or take their car away from them? And that's true with the emissions, uh, the onboard real-time roadway. What's the emissions uh, violation, let's say, of that car aside from their annual inspection? You know, what are you gonna do with that? Nothing. Uh, so, you know, again, Maybe we can frame that and it can be self-limiting in terms of what we might be discussing. That's all, just a perspective. But if you could help us get a sense of what is fundable. <laughs> and since, uh, I, mean, I mean, mine it was too big anyway, but uh, it could probably be narrowed down to a complete street thing with maybe a, an onboard analysis of survey for maybe twenty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. That's... That's it. But anyway, that's that was just a, a comment from me. Sorry. So um, I guess the money question. I mean, normally, normally we find out that information when they have it. I mean, so the fact that we haven't heard it probably means that they don't have it yet. I mean, but Strelika, over to you. Yeah. Uh, no. Thanks uh, so much for your question or and comment, John. Um, so the budget, we don't know that yet. Um, I get the sense that uh, the discrete studies program is going to be about level funded from last year. I think it was funded at about $330,000. So we can expect a similar amount, um, or a ballpark of that for this year. So that being said, some of those like much bigger ticket studies, 100,000, 150,000, like that's probably not gonna be able to be funded just because I can't have one study take up half of that budget. Um, in our preliminary discussions with staff, we have also identified some projects that could be funded at a lower level and 
with the goal of eventually having that project be absorbed into a program. Um, so this is especially true for some of the active transportation studies. Um, I believe at least one of the equity studies um, and potentially one other study that would be wrapped into either the data program or also the equity program. So there is space for some of these to lower their budgets um, to be able to be rolled into existing work. Um, we have also identified a number of studies that will that are somewhat beyond the scope of um, the MPO. So they would be, we'd be sending those to the T or to MassDOT or whoever the appropriate agency is to conduct that work. Um, but those con these conversations are still ongoing. They're so preliminary. Um, and, you know, we're open to any suggestions, any comments or preferences. And of course, as I emphasize, I think I emphasized this last year too, this is just the beginning. We have still time to refine these scopes, um, even the project descriptions until May, essentially. And even after that, uh, staff start presenting these work scopes to the MPO. They become even more refined. So uh, as I tell staff uh, and anyone submitting a study, don't be too married to the very specific description because it's probably going to change. So um, I definitely agree that there is there is wiggle room here to make a study uh, fit into the larger budget. So then are you amenable to us combining elements of studies mean into another study that isn't being listed here? You know, because yeah, I mean, I mean, I certainly see studies that I think could be combined, you know, but then I see some other studies that have elements that are interested and maybe you could combine them into a different study. I'm trying to make distinction with what I just said. Like sometimes they're very similar studies. And it's like, yeah, I mean, these two are so similar. You could just like do I me mean, mesh them together very easily. But there are others where it's like, huh, well, this element I mean, could go into that study. It's, it's, it's on maybe even a different sec, um, um, area, but you can pull that in. So are you amenable to that? Absolutely. And okay, right. if there's somewhere in that list that you're noting, like this study was takes elements, these elements from this one and these elements from this one. And we mm -hmm. think this is a better use of both of those studies. Uh, that absolutely makes sense. Okay. All right, John. I mute myself. Uh, yeah, I, I think, for instance, um, T8, which was uh, the station access could possibly be combined with uh, A3, you know, something like that. I mean, they're very similar in terms of their, their questions. Uh, but one other thing to take a look at as we're going through the evaluations of each one is be on the lookout for some flawed method methodology that's going to make it the outcomes very rather useless in terms of the research, uh, just in terms of these the uh, questions that are going to be asked to whom and by what method. Um, I, for instance, I didn't think that the um, the uh, GPS audit was necessarily going to generate accurate information, uh, given the audience that they're talking to in terms of uh, the, you know, just things like that. I mean, those people aren't necessarily going to answer you. <laughs> I mean, it, it's they aren't going to go on the record. They're, they're trying to stay away in many cases from um, ICE <laughs> and others. Uh, I don't think that's going to generate accurate. And also one of the livable streets when, because they're talking about um, unconvinced, you know, talking people out of uh, nimbyism uh, who are afraid of gentrification, but then they're talking about the benefits of gentrification. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, Kind of contradictory but anyway those are just two examples well oh, since logan's here i mean i just want to say i am all over the car sharing stuff so i'm going to be fighting real hard for that you know in the in the upwp committee um, mm -hmm. meetings meeting and, and mm -hmm. trying to mesh elements to that into every possible study i see so that if we can't get the specific study that you propose, or two, I think, uh, done those elements will be you know, in in um, other studies. So, 
So um, I may have questions for you, you know, but we'll save that for later because I am trying to uh, follow the instructions I was given, you know, to try to keep this on the on the higher level side, you know, and so, so, uh, so, all right, you know, so for any. Yeah, where else are there studies? Um, like if some of these studies, they can't be done here. Um, I'd love to know if they will could be done. It's funny, I feel like a grant funder who's asking this question, you know, which essentially we are. Um, but, you know, like uh, some of them, are there other organizations or are there other parts of MassDOT that could or would or might um, fund certain types of these studies um, to help us figure out if, you know, we're denying the study to be able to go through or we're just closing one door and there are some other very likely doors. Um, so sure. studies that are more relevant to MassDOT will probably end up going to the Office of Transportation Planning. Um, in terms of the other uh, entities, I honestly cannot speak to where, which specific department they would go to. Um, generally what we do is if we have studies say that are relevant to the T, we email our contacts at the T and say, Hey, we received these study ideas um, through our survey. Uh, they're not, you know, they can't be funded uh, through our program. Can you take these on and can you look into them more? Um, as to specifically who those people are, or specifically which department would work on it, I don't have that answer. And I think maybe to get at your your own question, Franny, and it's something that John said, it's it's be ultimately the CTPS will probably do. The work is a matter matter who pays for it. Be so so be and, and at the board we often see you know study um, proposals work 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 um work proposals is another word for it. You know um, that come across me where the, they are paying the the CTS uh, to do the work. I mean the board has to sign off on that. Usually the the um, person CPS who's going to do the work says, well, this, we have the capacity to do it, you know, so it's not going to take away from any other work I mean, that we're supposed to do for the MPO, but this entity wants to pay for us to do this study, I mean, and so, so I think for the META ones, that's what would happen, I mean, uh, I would even propose that for some that has come from uh, the advisory board, because by virtue of being on its um, um, administration and finance committee, I know it has some money, <laughs> so it's like, you want study done, you know, well, we're going to ask you to pay up for it a little bit, you know, so, uh, so, 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 so that's where the, the money would come from, but, the, but CTPS would do the work, because I'm not, I mean, I mean even, even MAPC asks the staff here to do the work, right, I mean, so is there, like, another, like, mass dot set of people who do research i don't think so right what about the office of transportation planning what's who's who's that where's i don't i'm not familiar with but in terms of who does who does the study so you know i genuinely i don't know if, yeah. if anyone would do research it would be at like at mouse.it it would be otp um they have a research group there okay all right so then i guess it'd be otp or or ctps because the mepc they do we do their research, right? Uh, some research, but they right. have their own uh, group. So, for example, right. some of the land use studies uh, yeah. in the universe this year, they're a bit more MAPC's wheelhouse. So, right. we'll let them know that, you know, maybe these are better suited to you than us. Right, right. And I was thinking about transportation as opposed to the land use studies. Okay, all right. John? Yeah, um, in a number of the laboratory transportation to from access uh, questions, uh, it can be addressed by uh, Boston BPD, BPDA, uh, the Boston Redevelopment Authority, and it's you know new, new format now. But they do a, that on a case by case basis, and those are all Article eighty uh, questions uh, in terms of mode share, what they deliver, what they don't, and there's a way of uh, backing into a mode share, uh, also by finding out what their projections are for uh, drive to um, uh, lab sites and things like that, what's going to be the drive to. So that, that's a site and it's so dynamic that it's, it's almost kind of a waste of time to some degree, except by going on by a case by case and they can do the averages for you on an article 80. So, because uh, there's so many of them ongoing uh, in 
not just uh, the South End, uh, uh, Alston, uh, things like that. So that's one source. And another can be, again, MAPC uh, on some of the bigger ones. And also backing into some of the research you did to get some of the projects that are already on the tip that we're going to be looking at later on. I think there are three there in community connections for shuttles and things like that. And those have been uh, uh, validated, I guess, uh, as useful uh, as so. I mean, those that's to some degree kind of reinventing the wheel unless we get into what are some of the obstacles for people to universally use those. So anyway, thank you. Sure, thanks. And so just say if we have another meeting and I, I'm, I'm totally fine with that, I wouldn't call it a 3C committee meeting because the 3C committee will actually review you know, the, um, the final uh, proposal by the um, MPO I mean, that it adopts me from uh, the recommendations of the UPWP uh, committee. I mean, so I would just say I'll call another meeting uh, of this group. I mean, and, and so we, we could just say, you know, um, it's going to be another meeting. I mean, advertise it as a full you know, meeting open to um, all now. You know, I, mean, um, I don't think we'd really be taking any votes at that meeting, so we don't have to worry about a quorum. You know, um, and we just have a discussion. You know, I mean, we'd set an agenda and a time, and and and, um, and then the meeting can, especially if we don't have a quorum, I mean, it can run long. I mean, if people wanted to, I mean, so so I would say think along those lines. You know. And maybe um, we could do something either at the end of the month you know, or the very beginning of of, um, of April. I mean, I probably I mean Wednesdays around this time might work for most people. I mean, uh, so think about that. I mean, and maybe we can make a decision and um, either by three twenty, um, which is when this segment is going to end, or at the very end of the meeting. So, so. Um, we do have several minutes for a second. Any more thoughts? John? Oh, that's a thumbs up. Thumbs up for a moment. Mira, you know. Franny? Yeah, no, that does sound good. And I'm starting to think, since there are, um, that was sort of eye-opening, that that question of CTPS doing some of the work, but funded another way. It was one question that wasn't really what I was asking, which was, um, these being done by somebody else, um, it makes me think there is value for us identifying a sort of general order for the whole thing so that we don't dismiss, so we don't lose um, our positive words about even the last one on the, the list, you know, that we don't just sort of shove it aside, but we sort of maybe comment. Maybe, maybe what I'm getting at is there might be some value to some kind of qualitative commentary from this committee on <laughs> on some of these like if we let, let's say people we said well this is a really great study um it has a big budget and um it would really be great for furthering equity in transit oriented development or you know some random thing that would put in some two cents that might help it in some of even if it didn't get funded by upwp it could be a sort of um way that this committee could extend its communication to other um, sources of funding who are looking at the same list. Well, I think that's a wonderful idea. And I would love it if the vice chair of this committee took it on. You know, uh, and, and so, so, I'm so willing, that's all, that's if, all yours? Process, if there are <laughs> comments on these, I'm willing to compile them. That, that's, that's yeah, that's, that's great. And, and you know, so, and, and, and to, to do that, I mean, um, look, I mean, we asked to have more input, you know, and, and last year, I mean, we asked me, uh, well, we wanted the universe, I mean, and, and certainly the staff said, look, there was just like fragments of ideas, you know, and I think staff rightly asked people to make real proposals. And for the most part, we got that, I mean, uh, there were about 12, 15, you know, that were still just fragments, you know, but, but as a result, we've got a lot to read, you know, but I think that's a nice problem to have, you know, because uh, there are a lot of good ideas in here, which I think is how I think we'll be able to synthesize some stuff, but I think to read it even more closely in order to provide Provide feedback, I mean, uh, uh, is going to be a lot more time, but I think it'll be time well spent. I mean, and 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 generally, my feelings are 
when someone posts the idea, you know, they they really take it on, you know, and take it on fully. So so it's a great idea. And that doesn't mean they have to take it on by yourself, Randy. Me and Glad would say lead the charge on it, you know, and that can be part of what we do, you know, in in um the extra meeting that we have. Um and 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 it don't, it doesn't have to all take place in that meeting, but that's that can be like the the launch point for it. Andy. Yeah, now that I've had some chance to like kind of bounce around too, I do think that these are much better quality in terms of like full ideas to consider. Um, so, you know, whatever Shuleika and other folks at the CTBS did and MPO staff to like get like much more fleshed out ideas, I think you all should continue to double down on whatever it was that caused this because it's really nice to see some, you know, well thought out ideas. As you mentioned, though, like, you know, it's kind of hard to sift through it all. And some of this will be like, you know, kind of directed toward different organizations, like, you know, maybe MAPC or o OTP or, or other organizations. So, um, you know, I think that's a natural part of the UPWP process. But I think we should probably, whatever we comment on in some way, also just appreciate the fact that there was a lot of thinking and effort gone into actually getting like full ideas this time. And we should just kind of probably make sure to say that whatever we do comment with. Um, just kind of priorities for myself. I really, uh, you know, have uh, after having bounced around a little bit too. I think um, just wanted to highlight. I think the studies M six and seven. I'm usually not particularly like enthused by the multimodal like studies. Usually, like that's kind of you know my general position. But these are two I think ideas that seem to be really kind of in the moment. Um, really important things to start considering. Um, from an adaptation to climate change perspective. Um, you know, there's been talk about Morrissey Boulevard in South Boston in particular that I think they're talking about, do, why do we even need to have the marina that's there? Um, because that bridge is, and that roadway is such a, such a big issue. Um, so, you know, I think managed retreat is something that it'd be nice to see at least a process laid out about how you go about to like actually evaluate what that means. Because I don't think any, in this region has really done that. And then M7, I think there are a lot of neighborhoods that have been historically um, completely excluded from public process. And while the highway revolt kind of has a long history in Boston, I, I do think that there are some major arterials that um, still were bulldozed through neighborhoods that, you know, it'd be good to have a process to evaluate where are those opportunities to look at the roadway network where, you know, maybe some, some communities were broken up because of it. And, that um, you know, environmental injustice is still there. So um, those are two things that I thought you know I was surprised by, and actually very encouraged to see that these are staff uh, sourced ideas. Um, so you know, I really just wanted to call out at least in this meeting that that's really um, encouraging to see because I did not expect it when I was starting to look through the list. Yeah, I love it when I mean um, it, things like that causes me to reevaluate or at least maybe think of topics. I mean, I think of one way differently, you know. So this is, I just think, a wonderful, amazing universe. Um, Franny? Yeah, I'd like, um, as I'm going to take a special uh, um, look at the studies that Susan Barrett came up with because I was sort of at the meetings. I don't remember if it was here or other ones I've been at with her. She's really convened a lot of communities um, to talk about inter-community transit. So I'm going to take a really good look at those. Um, and also just things pertaining to the RTA or just taking a look at how much e equity or whatever there is geographically in the studies um, in our region. You know, not too many are, you know, we're not doing only studies of ferries, say. <laughs> and we're also looking at, um, you know, the regional transit authority areas of our region, that kind of thing. So that's what some things I'm going to focus on. Great. Great. So we're going to do a hard break here. I mean, and, and, and I think there's general agreement, or at least no like strident disagreement against doing an extra meeting, you know, before our meeting on the 12th I meeting. So um, at the end of this meeting, we'll decide on whether that's going to be the first week of April or the last week of March. So if you need to leave before the end of the meeting and you want to chime in, just put your um, your um, option in in the chat all righty and so um with that me and thank you shaleka really you know uh great job 
Uh, great job overall. Great job to everyone who submitted the study. It's, uh, so uh, we have our work cut out for us, but it's a it's a, a delicious problem to have. Uh, so with that, we'll move on to um, the tip with Mr. Lapointe. You know, if, <laughs> Thank you, Len. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Ethan LaPointe. I'm the Transportation Improvement Program Manager. Uh, this presentation will provide an update on a few elements of the TIP process, starting off with TIP financials, contextualizing some of the projects that have been received by MPO staff uh, for consideration in the 2024 to 28 TIP in the new cycle. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide, please. So uh, starting off, I will start with a discussion on funding availability for the TIP and a brief overview on some of the factors that have influenced the funding availability, not just in terms of how much money the MPO is receiving in terms of apportionments, but a brief summary of some project readiness updates. We'll then move on to the meat of this presentation, which are the project scoring results, discussion on next steps and upcoming MPO meetings and other action items that staff are pursuing as part of development of the TIP, and a discussion about any of the projects uh, discussed here or presented here today. Going on to the next slide, please. Uh, in advance of today's presentation, uh, staff posted a table showing summary scores for each of the 19 projects that staff received applications for as part of the TIP development cycle. The application window for TIP applications this year start on November 7th for Community Connections last year and November 15th for the other five TIP investment programs with the application windows closing in late December, right before the holidays. Uh, this scoring summary breaks out the project scores not only by their main roll-up, their total score, but also how those projects performed against each of the MPO's vision goals and criteria. Going on to the next slide. This will take us, uh, and the next one too, please. So the primary goal here today is a review of evaluation scores and any other key details, namely their summaries, uh, with regard to what projects are under consideration for funding this year. What's the scope of work? How did they perform? What is the funding request? And where's their project readiness at for consideration? If we go on to the next. We can now discuss TIP funding availability. So this is the meat and potatoes really that serves as the foundation uh, for really all discussions regarding TIP programming scenarios, which will be coming up in the upcoming months. Uh, this table shows funding availability from fiscal year 2023, the current one, all the way out until 2028. Uh, as you can see here from the table on the top row, you can see the initial funding availability that is provided to the MPO by MassDOT for the regional prioritization of projects. Focus, of course, is 24 to 8. Uh, and one key thing to note here is that the 130.6 million, 128.4 million, and $125.2 million or $3 million in fiscal years 24 to 26, with each of those being respectively, remains unchanged from the current baseline estimates of the current TIP. So those years in terms of initial funding outlay remain the same for what was seen last year. A key change uh, between this year and last year is in fiscal years 27 and 28. MASTA uh, anticipates that it will actually be able to conclude debt service payments on its grant anticipation notes or GANs. Those are effectively uh, debt that was taken on by the state to finance bridge construction projects earlier, I wanna say in the decade, but before my time at least. Uh, and that debt service is being concluded. That allows for an additional knock-on effect that provides more funding to the MPOs now the debt obligations have been satisfied for 27 and eight. That amounts to approximately an additional 25 to $30 million more funding in 27 and eight that was initially anticipated. That is $155.1 million of initial outlay in 27 and $158.05 million in 2028. Looking down at the bottom two rows shown in the red and green, uh, again, main focus here is on 2024 to 2028. Uh, these numbers are different from what was seen at the end of last year's TIP adoption. What these numbers represent are the remaining balance of funding available after accounting for the initial obligation of funding for projects currently programmed in the TIP. One of the key drivers that has created this rather large amount of funding that remains on the table are project readiness updates, which were presented to the MPO back in uh, February. 
are being reviewed here today. In summary, there were several projects programmed in federal fiscal years 2024 that due to various project readiness concerns regarding permitting, inflation, and other factors on the design front were recommended for delay into federal fiscal years 2025, pushing them out of 24. However, the largest driver of funding availability, particularly between 25 and 8, is the recommended delay of the new Rutherford Avenue reconstruction project by MassDOT, which moved the start date of that project from 25 out into federal fiscal year 28. That project was in the tip under a condition that is known as AC or advanced construction, when the project was partially funded in each of those years in amounts ranging from generally around $30 million each year. Therefore, the slide has effectively opened up a significant amount of construction funding within federal fiscal years 24 through 28. One other th key thing to mention here is that while federal fiscal year 28 is a new year to the tip and in theory does not have any obligations against it for new projects, there are also continuing obligations that are factored in as part of this initial baseline analysis uh, for available funding. This includes a $2.5 million set aside for community connections, $6.5 million for the MPO's transit modernization investment program, and again, the AC projects, projects like Rutherford Avenue, McGrath Highway in Somerville, and Western Avenue in Lynn that were initially funded partially in fiscal year 2027 and will require additional funding in 28 to ensure that they can continue and have their full budgets programmed in the TIP. Going on to the next slide, we can talk about one of those obligations in a little bit more detail, and that's the Community Connections Program. Uh, Community Connections is a unique investment program in the TIP and that unlike other investment programs, it really relies on a set aside amount within the larger TIP pool. In the last develop in the development, excuse me, of the last TIP, the MPO board approved an allocation of approximately $2.5 million for Community Connections projects in a given year. That is for the entirety, however, of the Community Connections program. As this table shows, the MPO is currently funding eight projects that are shuttle pilot projects, which the MPO may fund a shuttle for three years of its first initial years of service, effectively operating as seed money. In these cases, as pilot projects, their funding obligation persists beyond that initial year in which they applied, and therefore they are effectively programmed against future years of community connections funding in that set aside. The key focus here is in fiscal 24 and 25, but really for 24 with regard to today's discussion. Of the eight that are currently programmed in the 23 to 27 tip, seven line items will be continuing into federal fiscal years 2024 and six into fiscal years 2025. Of that $2.5 million set aside for community connections, after accounting for ongoing shuttle obligations, there's $641,495 remaining to fund new community connections projects, the projects which we'll get to later. There's also $1.07 million, or 075 rather, in fiscal year 2025, and that figure may change should any shuttle projects be approved by the MPO board this year for additional funding or new projects to specify. If we go on to the next slide, we can do a quick overview of what the project scoring criteria looks like, and then we'll get into the projects. Starting off here, uh, there were 19 projects that were scored in this TIP cycle, which is down from 25 last year. That being said, while there were fewer projects scored overall this year by staff, staff scored far more new projects this year than last year. Of the 19, 18 were brand new projects, and only one project was returning. And with that, the one project that was received that had returned from a previous year had significant adjustments in its scope to accommodate the incorporation of its kind of multimodal rail trail improvements into a separate MassDOT funded line item. Similarly, again to last year, for distribution across investment programs, there were 11 applications received for community connections projects. That is the same amount of applications received last year, and there were five for complete streets, which is down from approximately eight last year. Only one application was received for intersection improvements, and two were received for the bicycle network and pedestrian connections programs. As stated previously in this presentation, based on project readiness, generally the MPO and staff seek to fund most new projects in federal fiscal years 2028 that is typically when there is the most funding available and where project readiness where those projects really are lead MassDOT engineers to recommend them to be funded in however that varies from project to project as we'll get into shortly and for one more slide before we dig into the projects uh just a quick disclaimer on project scores 
there are some differences between projects scored in the current tip and also projects that are currently evaluated this year. Namely, this represents the third tip cycle using criteria that were endorsed in October 2020. Uh, previously, before this cycle, projects were evaluated on a 134 point scale rather than 100. Moreover, the scores seen between different investment programs here, like complete streets versus intersection improvements, are not analogous to one another, and rather reflect the individual ways that those investment programs reflect the MPO's vision, goals, and objectives. Moreover, the scores that are presented here today were not only presented to the MPO board last week, but also have already been provided to the project proponents, and the scores have been revised to incorporate their feedback as needed, to reflect the total context and nuances of the project. In addition, the project status that is shown on the slides here reflects MassDOT's consideration and evaluation of the project. This includes status wherever applicable, namely in the form of the MassDOT Project Review Committee, or PRC, and key to this discussion, whether or not a project has received a 25% design by MassDOT engineers. I should note, there can be a discrepancy between what MassDOT has in their system and what an individual municipality may have in their records, depending on submissions. For example, as we will see later in this presentation, there are several projects whose status may only be listed as having achieved PRC approval, but may internally have a 25% or higher level of design already completed and just waiting on MassDOT review. With that, without further ado, I would like to now move into the bicycle network and pedestrian connections projects. Starting off with Malden Spot Pond Brook Greenway. This project uh, supports one component of a much larger regional project, which is known as the Mystic Highlands Greenway, but this one is confined to the city of Malden. This is a $3.25 million request for a dedicated shared use path facility that provides key connectivity throughout downtown Malden, north to south. The project scored 73 out of 100 points and is currently designated at a project review committee approval. However, as stated earlier, the city has actually achieved a level of 25% design and is working with its consultants right now to develop right-of-way plans and eventually take this to 75% design. While the right-of-way coordination is still being discussed, the project's general scope of work spans from the northern part of Malden, namely around the Coitmore Lee Park, all the way south to a connection with the Northern Strand Community Trail. The project area, as it currently exists, only about 25% of that area has bicycle facilities of any kind. And this project will instead create a complete comprehensive shared use path to provide for safe bicycle facilities throughout that corridor. Moreover, it also incorporates pedestrian and traffic calming enhancements as there are areas of the project where sidewalks may be unilateral, may be in poor condition or lack ADA compliance, including things like obstructions from utility poles. Uh, also, critically, not only does this project connect into the existing Northern Strand Community Trail, but also has tie-ins to the Malden Center T station, which not only serves the Orange Line, but also has access to a variety of bus improvements and bus routes, rather, throughout the corridor. Eventually, should the project receive approval and final completion, there are also plans in place to potentially extend the project into the Oak Grove station as well. Similarly, on that subject of bicycle connections into transit, if we go on to the next project, we can discuss Natick's Cochituit Rail Trail Extension. This project has received a 25% design submission from MassDOT, but you'll note that on screen there is no final score provided. At this time, this project was actually received after the scoring deadline closed uh, in early January from staff, and as part of the scoring process, uh, this project was evaluated after all others had concluded. I can say that right now the project's score has achieved 59 out of 80 points that it has been evaluated against so far, with equity scoring still to come and has therefore performed quite well. But onto the guts of the project really here, this project aims to extend the current terminus of the Cochituate Rail Trail in Natick from its terminus point around Mechanic Street and Cochituate Street into the new Natick Center commuter rail station, which is currently under construction from the MBTA. Moreover, this project not only adds connections into that transit stop, but dovetails an existing ongoing MassDOT construction project for complete streets improvements along Route 27. With the completion of this section of the trail, which will manifest really in the construction of a bridge that goes from the existing above grade position of the Kachichuit Rail Trail into an elevated structure at the new T station, basically there's a dip right there if anyone's familiar with it, where the rail platform is, that will also provide connections into downtown uh, Natick 
and its cultural districts, which have a significant amount of affordable housing and also commercial interests with regard to local businesses and also public facilities like the town hall, library, etc. This is really a coordinated effort between multiple projects municipalities here uh, and the $6.69 million request for this project, in addition to the 25% design received, positions it as one of the projects that may be considered moving forward because it has met those thresholds. But more on that in future MPO board meetings. Uh, if we go on to the next slide and the one after that, we can now move on to the complete streets funding program, starting off with alphabetically, Bellingham's roadway rehabilitation of Route 126 Hartford Road. The limits for this complete streets project go from the Medway town line all the way down to about 800 feet north of the I-495 northbound ramps in front of the North Bellingham Cemetery. As stated, this is a mostly complete streets project focusing on, excuse me, uh, focusing on the addition of bicycle lanes throughout the project corridor and taking areas that may only have sidewalks of poor condition on only one side of the road and making them entirely bilateral and bringing existing sidewalks into a state of good repair. Furthermore, the project also focuses on traffic calming improvements. This corridor not only includes a large amount of residential, but also several schools in the project area and a commercial district of the south, just south of North Bellingham Cemetery. As part of this effort, there will be signal installation and upgrades at the Maple Street intersections and Pearl Street intersections. And in order to accommodate regional connectivity along Route 126 for pedestrian and bike connections, the culvert that is at the northern term or bridge, I think actually is how it's classified, at the northern terminus of the project over the Hopping Brook will be widened to accommodate additional flood water flow and also to incorporate improved sidewalks and bike lanes to tie into any future work that may happen over in Medway. On to the next project on the subject of bridges, we can discuss a bridge in Charlestown. This is the Cambridge Street over MBTA trail project, uh, which is a bridge preservation and really deck replacement project for a major regional structure. The Cambridge Street Bridge is a fairly unique structure in that it is one of 34 bridges in the state of Massachusetts that is on the national highway system, but is not owned by the state of Massachusetts. Instead, in this case, being owned by the city of Boston. That being said, the bridge was originally constructed in the 1880s, reconstructed in the 1970s, so it's not that old. Uh, but it does carry Cambridge Street not only over the Orange Line tracks and the commuter rail tracks, but also Amtrak and is underneath the Interstate 93 overpasses, which ties it in or rather nests it amidst a variety of other transportation assets. Similar to the Kachichuit Rail Trail project we just touched on, this project was submitted late initially and is still pending a complete equity score evaluation. But of the 80 points of categories that it has been evaluated against so far, it has scored 47.25 out of those 80 points, which puts it a little bit above average. Again, there are more points that are likely to come once equity scoring concludes for this project. And not only does this project include deck replacement and steel repairs on a major regional roadway, but it improves pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure and helps to implement a bus lane in the westbound direction to incorporate easier westbound bus travel. There are three MBTA bus routes that traverse this bridge. If I am recalling them correctly, they are the CT2, the 86, and I want to say the 91. Cambridge Street is also not only a key pathway for Boston, but it continues westward into Somerville, again with those three bus routes, but it also effectively links Rutherford Avenue to the east and also McGrath Highway, both of which have projects currently programmed in the tip that are regionally significant for inner core municipalities. Uh, and as a state of good repair project, this effort may help to avoid any closures or load postings for this bridge that could help or potentially impact the construction and mobilization for those other regionally significant projects. On to the third project, it kind of takes us to a fairly unique kind of project that staff received. This is the Argilla Roadway Reconstruction and Adaptation Project in Ipswich. Uh, for those that may visit Crane Estate or Crane Beach, Argilla Road is the primary point of access for multiple tourist destinations and public open spaces, including recreational lands out in Ipswich. While the project area doesn't have many active residences for people, it is flanked by very sensitive wetlands uh, that are at high risk from coastal flooding and erosion. This project focuses on adaptation and resiliency, namely elevation of the roadway to adapt to king tide floods and shoring up embankments. Current climate projections rate that the project will flood regularly by 2030 under king tide conditions 
and under current conditions, the roadway already floods six to 12 times a year at King Tide. Moreover, in order to facilitate the natural transmission of flood water and also the natural capture properties of wetlands, the project will remove an existing bottleneck at the existing culvert over the Ipswich River by widening it and remove a, uh, an old outdated weir system that is currently basically bottlenecking the travel of flood water. In addition, not only will that help to restore the wetlands to their natural state, but it also adds two more culverts, new ones, elsewhere along the roadbed, such that should the road flood, it can transmit additional water through the, uh, the roadway and maintain access. That being said, because of these sensitive areas that flank the roadway, the constrained dimensions really limit the ability to make multimodal enhancements that are formal. That being said, in order to really do that, one would have to widen the road into those sensitive natural areas, but the project proponent has looked to stabilize the shoulder using natural plantings and also embankments to at least create a more safe refuge for pedestrians on that shoulder. Not ideal, not formal, but that being said, it's what can be done within the permitted space. Uh, by the same coin, there would also be no bicycle lane installation because of the limited roadway dimensions within the striped area. The roadway uh, currently sees about 500,000 visitors a year, mostly to the Crane Beach area, and the summer also supports transit in the form of the Ipswich Explorer bus from the Cape Ann Transportation Authority. And on to the next slide, this brings us to our returning project, being the Envision Wakefield Main Street Improvements Project. Uh, this is a project that has seen some significant scope adjustments, namely a portion of this project that would have constructed the Wakefield section of the Wakefield Linfield Rail Trail has actually been moved and funded under a separate statewide uh, line item. Uh, this is part of what Wakefield refers to as its Envision Wakefield Main Street Improvements Project, which is on Route 129 in Wakefield, as the name suggests, its main street. This is a major pedestrian and commercial district that is near to open spaces on its upper and lower commons, uh, and also Lake Quanapawit. In this area, there's also access to the Wakefield commuter rail station, and it's a fairly mature and kind of historic district for the municipality. The main focus of this project really in consultation with a fairly robust public outreach process, including local schools, has been improving multimodal accessibility. This project reconfigures parking along the street of Main Street, reducing it in many areas to add a shared use path along the entirety of the corridor downtown and extend sidewalks add curb cuts and uh, bump outs for accessibility for the MTA bus routes, improve turning geometry to improve emergency response times, namely for the nearby Wakefield fire station, and also pedestrian refuges, islands, pedestrian scale lighting improvements, and also street trees. Interestingly as well, the section of Common Street, namely down at the lower common, will be closed off to traffic in order to function as a dedicated no through traffic parking facility to relocate some of that existing parking and make it more inviting and accessible for pedestrians and cyclists to navigate. This project will continue up in from Water, West Water Street to Church Street, but is also part of a larger effort from the municipality, Wakefield, to add additional bicycle connections throughout its uh, town, including along West Water Street, which is currently underway. We, uh, there is also an existing trail along Lake Quinnipawit that extends northward from the project's terminus at the lake up Route 129. And similar to Malden Spot Pond Brook, this project is also included in that regional Mystic Highlands Greenway uh, plan. On to the fifth and final project in the Complete Streets funding category, we have the reconstruction of Canton Street, which goes from the East Street Rotary to University Avenue. This project is a hybrid project between Complete Streets and bridge replacement. With a total budget request of about $19 million, and a project score of 52.8. This project has already achieved a 25% design and really focuses again on making a complete street here. There are no sidewalks currently along this section of roadway and the project proponent has a, uh, proposed the installation of new sidewalks along the westbound shoulder for the entirety of its length and a shared use path off-road grade separated along the eastbound side from University Avenue all the way up to the rotary. This is a key residential zone for Westwood and also has connections to open space in the northwest terminus of the project. Moreover, the uh, town has also made improvements themselves along a local road, Blue Hill Drive, which is not shown on the map on screen here, but it's 
really up at the northeast there that has bicycle lanes. The shared use path proposed under this project would, would tie into that Blue Hill Drive lane, which extends all the way down to the Route 128 MBTA and also Amtrak commuter rail and Amtrak station there, providing for additional multimodal access into those transit facilities. For some freight improvements as well, the project uh, replaces bridge N25032. Uh, it has that name because it goes over a CSX freight line right there. Uh, as part of the bridge replacement, the bridge will be elevated in order to improve clearance for freight rail moving throughout that corridor. For those familiar with University Avenue, it's a major commercial and also industrial district within Westwood, in addition, of course, to its transit connections. Next up for our last tip project, we have the one project that was applied for, excuse me, for uh, intersection improvements. This is the Randolph and York Street intersection project uh, in the town of Canton. Now, this project has not yet gone through MassDOT's project review committee. I'll get to more on that later and what that means. But its main focus here is on a signal installation at York and Randolph Streets in Canton. Uh, Randolph Street has witnessed significant increases in traffic volumes since the construction of new housing developments, namely multifamily developments, more eastward along uh, the roadway. The town is seeking a near-term improvement to slow traffic at this intersection, which is in front of the Blue Hills Regional Technical School and also Massasoit Community College. Just east of here as well, nearby the inner cross street of Colts Crossing, is also a trailhead for the Blue Hills. However, because this project was not yet reviewed by MassDOT's Project Review Committee, it was not recommended to move forward by MassDOT staff until it achieves that threshold. That being said, MPO staff and MassDOT personnel from Highway District 6 are working with the town of Canton to meet that project review committee milestone. And moreover, given this was a kind of initially proposed as a stopgap, also potentially integrate additional multimodal improvements and long-term resurfacing and drainage enhancements for the Randolph Street corridor to create a complete street. For reference, Randolph Street currently does not have sidewalks and does not have bicycle lanes, and the roadway condition between York Street over to 138 to the west is in fairly poor condition. Moreover, the 138 and Randolph Street intersection is also a top 200 statewide crash location. So bottom line, staff are currently working with the municipality to develop a more comprehensive project for complete streets and also to find a way to potentially work with MassDOT to facilitate some near-term improvements given it is not likely to be funded through the TIP at this time. With that, you're now halfway there and we are now in the community connections section of this presentation. If we go on to the next slide, we can talk about the first and only project that we have for the transit signal priority program, uh, uh, transit signal priority investments. This is Lynn's Broad Street Corridor TSP project with a request for $297,800 from the MPO for fiscal years 2024. The main focus of this project is an upgrade on existing traffic signal equipment at seven signalized intersections along Broad Street with a focus on improving safety and efficiency really for transit systems throughout the city of Lynn, but also really on one of the busiest corridors in Lynn for buses and all other modes of travel. This is evidenced by ridership data where there are 5,100 daily bus riders within Lynn and Lynn currently has about 2,000 uh, different housing units planned and permitted along the project corridor, indicating that there is likely to be a significant increase in transit demand in the near term for the city, uh, for, excuse me, for the project area. If we go on to the next slide, uh, this kind of shifts us really into uh, bike share projects, bike share being blue bikes. This year, there were two projects that requested and sought funding from the MPO to facilitate the adoption of electric blue bikes or e-bikes as I'll refer to them for the rest of this presentation, First one being Boston. This is a request of $1.02 million for 272 electric bikes and a 136 spare batteries for the city of Boston's Blue Bikes Network. This project aims to uh, shift approximately, I wanna say 10% of the overall city fleet of Blue Bikes into an electrified category using the existing contract that is currently in place with MAPC and other stakeholders. This does not involve expansion of the current Blue Bikes network or the installation of any new docks and rather only changes the existing fleet. Similarly, if we go on to the next slide, we have Cambridge's uh, electric Blue Bikes adoption project. Uh, this project sought $352,575 for 
for the procurement of 90 e-bikes and 45 spare batteries uh, for Cambridge's existing Blue Bikes network. Again, there's no expansion here, no adjustments to existing stations. This is just procurement of new electric bikes uh, for Blue Bikes, which uh, I'm happy to answer any questions there, but would have a different kind of fare structure as well. At least that's our understanding of it. Moving on, however, to the third project, that takes us to a more traditional Blue Bikes expansion effort, this one being Medford's Blue Bikes expansion. This $118,643 request from the city of Medford involves the purchase and installation of four new Blue Bikes docks with 25 new traditional non-electric bikes. Again, this is an expansion of an existing Blue Bike system in Medford on top of what they have already applied for in previous cycles of the TIP and were awarded for through Community Connection and really focuses on bike share improvements that are targeted at transit sites and public spaces throughout the city of Medford, just to kind of supplement and complement the existing network. In a similar vein, but moving away from blue bikes, really, if we go on to the next slide, we can go on to Medford's bicycle parking tier one project. Uh, this is approximately $30,000 request from the city of Medford to purchase and install 40 bicycle racks throughout the city to create an additional 80 bicycle parking spaces. Uh, tier one in the context of this project refers to the prioritization system that the city has implemented, which is on a three tier approach as far as which areas should be addressed first. Tier one being highest priority. Uh, additional tiers may come in future years of the TIP, but right now MPO staff only received one application for these 40 racks in locations all over the city, namely in key commercial districts, transit centers, public spaces, etc. Similar vein. If we move on to the next slide, we have two bicycle rack projects from Canton. The first one is the Canton Center Bicycle Rack Project, which is a $10,000 request, which as the uh, name implies, uh, this project is seeking funding in order to install bicycle racks at the Canton Center MBTA station and also elsewhere along downtown Canton. If we go on to the next slide, uh, Canton is also seeking an additional $22,500 to incorporate the purchase and installation of bicycle racks at three of their elementary schools, one middle school, and one high school. There are already bicycle racks at those schools, but they have severely deteriorated, and while currently approximately 10% of the 3,164, I think, public school students in the town of Canton uh, currently walk or bike to school, the, city, uh, the town is currently looking to increase that number to approximately 20% in the near term and is currently looking at the installation of bicycle lanes bidirectionally along Dedham Street to help facilitate that in addition to the existing sidewalks. Moving on to the next slide, uh, this takes us into the shuttles that were mentioned earlier in this presentation, starting off with Concord's Workforce Shuttle. The funding that is shown here on these sl shuttle slides consolidates the funding requests by these municipalities into the full three-year window. This project has requested $369,000 uh, in aggregate across three years to support its shuttle pilot, namely about $137,000, I believe, in federal fiscal year 24. This is a fixed route shuttle service that really focuses on connecting users of the West Concord commuter rail stations to several key employment concentrations, including Concord Center throughout the municipality. This includes MCI in Concord, Best Western, and also Newbury Assisted Living, just to help it stimulate some mode shift, move people out of cars, get them using transit, and also local shuttle solutions. In a similar vein, the next project is a demand response project. It's actually an expansion of an existing service from the Metro West RTA. This is the Catch Connect Microtransit Expansion Phase 2, which focuses on the municipalities of Framingham and Natick. As stated, this expands an existing service from Metro West. Uh, through its microtransit program uh, and expands existing availability between 7.30 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. Monday through Fridays to try to capture some of the workforce commuters that may have their shifts and later in the evening to help them make their own connections with various transit destinations and other facilities throughout Framingham and Natick. This is really a supplemental public transportation resource that helps to really complement conclusion of fixed route service during the day and other routes operated by Metro West RTA. If we go on to the next slide, we can then discuss a fairly unique application that staff received this year. This is the North Reading Demand Response Shuttle Pilot uh, Program. 
This project really focuses on providing a new demand response interdistrict trans uh, public transportation system that focuses mostly on older residents within North Reading, people with disabilities, and those that may need regular non-emergency medical trips. As North Reading is currently not served by the ride, MBTA's paratransit, uh, or from similar services throughout uh, Merrimack Valley. Therefore, this project would seek to fund uh, facilities and transit opportunities for those that may not have the alternative to not use a car to reach those non-emergency medical trips, but would be publicly available to all users as well. Lastly, we have the uh, Revere on-demand shuttle service. This is a similar kind of workforce oriented shuttle. This is a proposed shuttle service for requesting approximately $1 million over three years that would operate on a daily basis with some limited weekend service to capture some individuals within Revere that may work in service industry jobs or specifically here, Amazon, uh, Amazon distribution centers within Revere that operate throughout the week. Initially, the service would focus on residents of Revere only that uh, may access the service between 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, but may eventually extend weekend service once it gets up and running from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the weekends to complement that. With that, that was a lot, uh, but that is the last project that we have there to discuss today. Go on the next slide, we can go to discussion. I'm happy to go back to any of the other previous projects and discuss there. Uh, if there's questions there, I know that there's been a couple in the chat thus far. So, okay. Well, if do you want to um, address ones in the chat first, Ethan? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I had to sure. get some water real quick. It's okay. Uh, it's fine. So, uh, first off, I'll answer. Okay, I think we have the first question from John. Will the Wakefield uh, Envision Main Street project reach the rail station across North Avenue? Uh, so with regard to that project, uh, the rail station will actually be connected into by an ongoing effort by the town of Wakefield to add bike lanes in along those locally owned roads already. Uh, so this is a state owned road, which is why they're seeking TIP funding, but the municipality already has their own plans that will be locally funded, some of which are already underway along Water Street. Or I think that's South Water Street in that area maybe, uh, to make those additional last mile connections there. That being said, uh, it, as part of meetings between MPO staff and the town, we have also highlighted the community connections program as a potential avenue to help facilitate some of those last mile connections on locally owned roads. Yeah. Any other questions or, or if not, we'll go to John McQueen. On that, uh, hi Ethan, thank you very much. Very well done, thank you. You're, uh... You're great. We're used to Matt Genova, who did a wonderful job, and you're stepping right into his shoes. Um, on the Wakefield, are they kind of uh, crossing over to the rail station across North Avenue? Are they going to have any, um, let's say, rectangular flashing beacons or whatever traffic uh, control signals? Uh, because North Avenue is <laughs> a very heavily traveled road, and especially at uh, prime time. Um, Prime time rail schedule time, uh, so it uh, would be a real help. The, that and any prominent or divided, um, separated uh, bicycle lanes uh, as features on that, because they get uh, it's, it's a constrained uh, right of way, and, and there's a lot of on street parking too. And just yeah. quickly, I'm sorry to interrupt. Gustav, if you can drop the um the screen, it's great. Thank you. Sorry, Ethan, go ahead. Yeah, of course. Uh, I would like to clarify what I just said too. The road that I mentioned that the municipality is looking to extend bike lanes on is West Water Street. Uh, but to your question, John, uh, I can't speak to the exact scope of work that the municipality is designing with regard to what implementations they are seeking. I do know that those RFBs and you know other beacons like Hawks uh, had come up in discussions. I can, however, reach out to the municipality just to get some additional context. Uh, like I said, it came up in meetings about Main Street, but the focus there was really on the project applied for on the tip. Uh, and as I mentioned, we did also say that if they were looking to do connections across North Avenue in the future and on all the any other adjacent streets there, Westwater, Richardson, MPO would be happy to work with them to use uh, community connections funding to fund them. 
because that would be where the signalization would come under and the intersection uh, or community connections uh, funding. Uh, crosswalks, hawks, bicycle right. lanes, restriping, bike racks, right. anything there. Yeah, got it. Now, now, can I think I had another question regarding CMAC and its uses. Can some of these bike racks uh, and or signals, probably more of the bike racks, they've traditionally been funded under CMAC. Yeah, so uh, incidentally, the entirety of the Community Connections program is actually funded by CMAC. So because they were applied for under community <laughs> connections, they would be funded by CMAC if the board approved them. So the answer is yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else? Um, I was trying to find it um, while you were talking. There, um, there's a site mean where you can find a full description of a project I mean, if you have the project number I mean, um does it I mean if I used to access it I can't remember where it is do you do you know what I'm talking about Ethan I do actually uh let me drop a link in the chat real quick sure. this is a mass dot site that I use if you do have the six digit project number which uh, yeah. those are all included on the materials posted for this right. meeting, this is the project info site. Yeah. Uh, for those that may be new to this, if you select the buy MPO option on that website, uh, you can just set it to Boston Region MPO and you'll get a full list of all projects in the MPO and can search by that. Uh, that not only get, helps to give you a brief overview of a project description, but also can provide you with access to project status, estimated budgets, things of that nature. That is a public service. Uh, can also find let me see if this is public i want to say i will also drop this in the chat because this i believe can also be a handy resource uh, for those that have access i will also add the project viewer which is a gis application that you can use to view all highway projects within the state uh and search by project number mpo municipality as well uh, and yeah. it also has a tie out to that website I posted that can give you status updates. All right, I'll, I'll see, you know, I might have to um, go to something that I had created uh, a while ago um, and see if it's the same project um, information. Because I mean, the nice thing about it was it, it just kind of, it showed you like the the, um, the um, information that you were showing us doing your um, presentation here and, and uh, yeah, so what's nice is that, and what I was going to request is, is if on the sheet with the, the scores, you know, that has a project number, okay, if it'd be possible to um, hyperlink that project ID you know, to a place where you could get the information about the project, it would be really helpful when you are trying to make an assessment I mean, uh, of the, the project versus you know, its score, you know what I mean? Am I making sense um, as as to the request and why why I'm making that request? Yeah, that actually makes sense, and that's a pretty good idea. So yeah, and because I mean, when especially when we are like me trying to make decisions, we you know, there will come that meeting uh, in March or April, I mean, where I mean, we have the numbers, we have the scenarios. I mean, we're just trying to hash everything out. I mean, uh, and and you're looking at the scores, you're looking at the project. I mean, and and a lot of times you'll have like multiple um, PDFs, you know, but it would be really nice if you could have like that, that, that PDF with the scores, I mean, and that project number, and then you could just like very easily click on that and then kind of see a real description of another project as opposed to having to um, pull up another PDF. That said, I mean, I'm sure there are people with the PDFs printed, I mean, all in front of them, you know, or already loaded up, I mean, on their computer and they don't need it. But to the extent it's not a, uh, uh, time consuming ask, you know, I, I make the ask. And I think it's one of those things too, that once you, you know, do the, the like work on it once you can easily apply it to other documents whenever you have to, um, to do it. And, um, and, and if for some reason, um, you'd like to do it and you don't have the bandwidth to do it. I did it a couple of years ago because I found it really helpful on my own, you know, certainly after April 1st, I'll have the time to, to throw in something like that. So thanks for 
from at least entertaining the request. All right, um, Franny. Yeah, when I love so many of these projects, you can just tell where my preferences is. Um, I have the same question I've asked for many years is are we taking, or by we, I guess I mean MassDOT or, um, and sort of top down look, the communities that think to apply for funding to put in a shared use bike trail, going to their commuter rail in their area, what is the set of those towns and which towns aren't applying and is there an e equity issue amongst, is it, is it being spread out and are we making everybody um, sort of come up with it on their own or are we looking at it sort of top down and saying, look, we put in these bike connections. How many of these um, downtowns or commuter rail stations do have these kind of connections? And, um, and if they don't, do we ever approach the communities and say, hey, we'd like to help you develop an application to do this because this funding is available? Um, or does it just take the community? Anyway, that's my question. That is a fantastic question. Uh, so as part of the TIP development process, generally in October and November, that's when staff, including myself, reach out to different municipalities to solicit ideas for potential projects they may seek or prompt really additional projects they're looking for. Uh, with regard to distribution of bike path projects, it's actually pretty varied. Uh, staff do receive various applications. A lot of rail trail projects like Swamp Scott, Peabody, the one we heard from today regarding Natick, uh, Crossett Situate border to Boston Trail over in Boxford, uh, but also more inner core like Malden, one's downtown, Boston, uh, Medford with the Wellington Greenway. Uh, so there's definitely some variety there that spans different parts of the region, which is good. Uh, with regard, though, to the project scoring and evaluation process, uh, on staff, we also use uh, some materials and resources provided by our partners at MAPC uh, for their trail map application, which helps to identify existing routes, not only paved routes for bike paths, but also unpaved, unimproved routes like off-road dirt paths, uh, maybe in like back roads or power line access routes, easements where there's sidewalks. Uh, in addition to that, which shows what exists, MAPC also has what's called their local access utility tool, uh, which we use as like kind of an internal layer. And what the local access score that MAPC refers to or provides in that context does is it counts up adjacent needs, things like uh, are there hospitals, schools, libraries, things of that nature, and will grade a road and say this road may have an access rating of five on a scale of about 25. In the case of the Cambridge Street project, for example, that project scored very highly as having a major ac uh, utility access for bicycles, but not so much for pedestrians, uh, largely because of the Sullivan Street, uh, excuse me, Sullivan Square connection and its proximity to larger scale housing developments or other kinds of emergency facilities, Bunker Hill Community College, things like that. Uh, the short answer is yes, we do account for it. The long answer is that we are fortunate enough to have a lot of tools that we can use in addition to, of course, working with our you know, member municipalities and having pretty good relationships there to solicit ideas. That, that's good. Can, Len, can I add one extra? Yeah, please. Please, um, please. It's, I also get equally interested in the shuttles and with that same question. Um, and when it comes to the Concord shuttle, um, I know that was started to be funded maybe with a slight different focus. Um, right before the pandemic, and then it got canceled. I forget what program was funding it. Um, and I hope that just glancing at the map, I wasn't sure if the, first of all, the hospital and the courthouse being in there are both really important destinations, and the prison. Um, and also there is a Yankee bus line to Copley Square that stops in Acton, downtown Concord and Boston. And that would be really important to include <laughs> um, as a connection with that shuttle. And lastly, there are so many people in our area just west of there that have trouble getting to medical appointments or getting back late in the day from medical appointments in 
at Emerson and in Concord. And this train being there, if the focus on getting to the train could be coupled with last mile getting off the trains in Acton, Littleton, Lemonster, et cetera, um, it could really provide good transportation choices back rather than just sending all along that rail, sending shuttles. I mean, yeah, or not even shuttles, sending just paratransit vehicles. Yeah, I think we could, or by organization, take care of the, take advantage of the train more. So I just wanted to put a plug in those considerations when you're looking at that Concord shuttle. Okay. Well, um, I think we might be behind schedule at this point. You know, so so um, I think if um, I have any other questions, you know, just make we'll take one more. You know, if not, we'll um, thank Ethan. And, and I think Ethan's planning on coming back and, um, <laughs> at our next meeting or the one after that. At our probably our April meeting, right? I think so. Yes. Okay. All right. You know, so thank you, Ethan. Well, and 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 at that point, we'll have scenarios, right? Yes. So for scheduling, MPO board will be meeting next week to uh, review initial scenarios, and then at the March 30th meeting, there will be a decision regarding which of those scenarios with adjustments should be final. All right. All right. So then we'll be um, commenting, I guess, on the um, on the chosen scenario. Now, last time I recall that um, for us to be make an input into the choice of the scenario, we did have a meeting in between uh, our uh, normally um, our, our March and April meetings. Now uh, we're doing that, you know, for for um, the UBWP meeting, and so and I can keep. So you say the next meeting you give us a skip the the scenario. So that'll be that'll be tomorrow, and then the one after that. Uh, no, sorry, I misspoke. Uh, uh, next okay. week. Oh, next week. Tomorrow okay. is yeah. Tomorrow's scores. I got a little bit too eager there. No, no problem. Maybe, maybe <laughs> I just heard you. So so then so the sixteenth we get the, the the scenarios, and then I was looking at the calendar. I thought we had a meeting every. Um, Thursday, but I don't see one on the 23rd. So then the one after that would be on the 30th. All right. So then that may help us determine when we want to have our next meeting. Because if we do want to chime in uh, before the scenario um, is chosen, uh, that might be the meeting. I mean, although if you're going to tell us which, which one we picked at that point, it might not be enough time for us to really be make any impact on that. So, so, um, Food for thought, you know, as to whether we do something um, even sooner after the meeting on the 16th. Because let's say, um, Ethan, we had the meeting on the 16th and the advisory council wanted to chime in before the 30th, we'd have to get to you like in um, like about a 30, 23 or something like that, right? Okay. All right. You know, so so that would be even sooner than we were thinking. I mean, so that'd be maybe like the um, today, what is the so that'd be like the 22nd and so so i guess in the last few minutes because i'm going to skip the chairs for it and um how, what are people thinking about um meeting that's the 29th the 22nd if we want to be chime in on the scenarios uh before it's selected and, uh the 29th if we just we want to focus on the upwp um universe same goes for the the um the fifth you know and well, one more thing ethan so uh, once the scenario um is chosen we so they'll be chosen um by the meeting the 30th and so the mpo will at that point put it out for or, or we have to is there more time before we determine uh, which plan goes out to the public for review yeah good question so the 16th will be initial presentation of the scenarios the 30th will be a decision around which of those should move forward and be finaled. That being said, the tip won't actually be released for public comment until April 20th. Okay, all right, and, and that's that's when the clock starts ticking on us for our three C meeting to um, to make our comments. And uh, so, so, um, so, do people have a feeling as to uh, when uh, they want to meet next? The 22nd, 29th, 5th. If we don't, if we do anything after the 22nd. 
we are reacting we, to the um, chosen scenario. We, uh, uh, we, we now, uh, yeah, so. Just to clarify, Lynn, is this like you're proposing another meeting to talk about both the TIP and the UPWP? Well, if it's a 20 sec, if it's a 20 second, could be the TIP and the UPWP because the 20 second we'd be able to weigh in on scenarios, maybe have some input, mean as to the scenario that's chosen, you know, uh, me as a full council, you know, me, I, I will be at these meetings so I can. I can speak to things, you know, uh, but if um, everyone else wants to be, say something and help inform me as to what I say, uh, that's fine. I mean, and there's certainly nothing stopping you from watching the meetings, you know, uh, even after they have been, you know, they're recorded. You can certainly watch the meetings and then send me an email I mean, about what you think. I mean, and I can take that into account I mean, when weighing in on the scenario that's chosen that wouldn't violate, violate OML. I mean, I simply I mean, um, listen to read what you have to say and take that into account I mean, in what I say, I mean, maybe just repeat it. I mean, so, so, um, so I tell you what, um, why don't we um, tentatively set up a meeting for the 22nd? And if that's not working for people, you know, then we can fall back to the 29th or the 5th, okay? I mean, I think that gives us the ability to have maximum Im impact input, you know, and, and Would so 3 p.m. work on the 22nd, yeah, 2.30? If that works better for you, that's what I'm, I'm fine with flexing to that, you know, so. And we can keep the meeting. Uh, and we can keep the, we could try, well, we would be talking about two things. So maybe it's not uh, reasonable for me to try and keep it to be 75 minutes. So why don't we plan on an hour and a half? Yeah. Okay. Can, can you send out a calendar invite for that so we can have it come up as a warning? Sure. Yeah, I can well, definitely I mean, follow up offline um, yeah. with, with more info on that as well for everyone. Thank you. So, um, so sorry, running over um, on this. I mean, so, um, if anyone has anything they want to add to business, um, I I just realized oh, I don't have cemetery commission that day. We're skipping March, so my request for three is irrelevant. If people prefer to keep it typical time, um, that works for me. Okay, so two thirty. All right, so we're back two thirty. Okay. okay, fine. So. So two thirty, four o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Question. John. Yes, John. I tried to uh, <laughs> I tried to put it in the chat that the 29th works for me. Uh, I somehow got into a direct message uh, thing with uh, with Franny that I can't quite find out how to get out of to do a broadcast. You have to uh, choose everyone on the list. Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to register the 29th for me. Um, right. Well, well, that's best. I understand. Is the 22nd possible? Because I'm not, sure. I'm not, I'm, I'm not really sure because I've got yeah. that's a that's it's it, today's been a this week's been a jammed week and that next week is too. Okay. Well, in, or the well, weekend after, or week after that. But, yeah. Well, the reason that we're pulling things forward though is to be have to have input on this yeah so so me, I, look trust me i prefer to fist you know because because um I mean, that that's a intense week for me you know um so but um but i think in order to give us the opportunity to uh, say yeah. something at the 20 um by the 30 is me to say i've sent something to ethan so that he can take it into account and um make a decision about the scenario that's run i think that's probably the best time you know so um, and if folks mean we can get to that meeting and then decide that we want to have a shorter meeting that focuses only on the tip and then maybe even have another meeting to focus on the UPWP being um, later on. So we'll put both on the agenda to deal with open, open meeting law. My understanding is that you can have more on the agenda, uh, but then not include it in the meeting. You know, uh, we can't have less on the agenda and then add stuff. Uh, so, so we'll so, put both on and then discuss I mean, what we can. So the 20, 22nd would be solely on the tip, is that correct? 
Well, I said, we, we could make that an option. I mean, especially I me. Mean, why don't we come into it thinking we're going to do both, okay? An hour and a half that we're going to do both. If we get to it and most people at that meeting feel they, they are fine with having another meeting, meaning that deals with the UPWP, then we'll do another meeting. But most people are there going, nah, this is it, Len. No more before the next meeting in April, then that'll be it, okay? Why don't people submit like to Stella? Um, any ideas they want? We can't by open meeting law be all discussing it and passing it on. But if you have opinions and you can't come, pass on your ideas to Stella to share with us at the meeting. Sure. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy to collect and Thanks. pass along anything. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. So, um, so let's um oh so minutes I mean um so let's get um a uh, quick I'm, approval i yeah. move to approve the minutes of december was it 12th 14th. i can't remember 14th. 14th um 2022 all right let's get a second i'll second thank you Anna christina so a uh, motion to approve the minutes and a second by um uh, for any husband and second by Anna christina and uh, a quick roll um, Stella? Sure. Um, Len? Yes. Granny? Aye. Uh, Anna Christina? Sorry, I forgot if my meal was on. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, David Montgomery? Is yes, that a I yes? Think you cut I think out it was a yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a yes. Yeah, it was a yes. Okay. <laughs> John so nitrous. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, John Seward. Yes. And Scott Stakis. Yes. And I'm so sorry, Andy. Last but not least. Yep. Okay. Um, so that passes unanimously with the quorum. Thank you all. Um, yeah. We'll take a motion to adjourn and we won't have to do a roll call on this one. So. I move to a, I move to adjourn. Uh, can you get a second? Second by by John. So motion to adjourn by. Well, so 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 moved and so done. Hey, we're so done here <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> so, so, so thank, thank you, everybody. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Acclamation. Everyone. <laughs> thank you all. I, I'll hang around, Stella, in case you want to mm -hmm. debrief on this. Um, yeah, I don't need. I don't need paper.